Hey, what's up guys? Eben here. So today I'm going to share with you a special little something uh, from my website. I'm going to share the first part of a tutorial completely free here on the channel. I want to share this with you as a thank you to those of you who have joined my channel so far. And for those of you who are joining us right now, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button below. Hit that bell so you can get notifications about content like this as I put it out on my channel every Wednesday. Uh, also stay tuned uh, to the end of the video for a little promo code you can use to get 25% off of the tutorial on my website. Thank you again, guys, and uh, enjoy the video. Hey everyone, this is Eben, and today I'm gonna take you through my painting process from start to finish in a little tutorial here of a, uh, a piece I made recently. So I'm going to start with the thumbnailing process and just the general idea generation and then move on to creating a value sketch and coloring and uh, painting in the rest of the details and finally adding textures and final adjustments and details and color balancing and so on. So. The, uh, the whole piece here took around 10 hours from start to finish. I'm not going to take you through every moment of that. I've sped it up to about uh, three times speed. So it should be slow enough for you to be able to see the, uh, the details in the process, but also to kind of get a general idea of, of how I'm moving throughout this process from the start. So um, what you'll see I'm doing here is I'm just setting up a few thumbnail canvases and uh, this is a, a, a little bit less than I would typically do I think for a, a project especially a commissioned piece I would probably do between six and nine thumbnails to get started um, I like I like doing around nine just because it tends to fit well on the canvas and um, looks nice and I think it's a, a good number for generating a solid amount of ideas and getting some good variety, some different takes on a particular theme. There's really no limit to how many of these you can do, uh, it just depends upon how much time you want to spend in this phase of the process um, or, uh, you know, if you feel that after a few of them you have a solid idea, it's you know you can you can pick one of those and roll with that. But I uh, I really like to spend you know some time, not too much time on each individual uh, thumbnail. I think I, I I aim for spending about 10 to 15 minutes on each of these max. Um, but I think it's good to flesh out these ideas and experiment and just remain pretty loose with the ideas at this point, you know, not really getting too attached to anything and not having too much of a, a solid idea of, of where you want to go with this. Uh, and that will depend too on the type of project you're doing. You know, this is a, this is just a, a personal piece. Um, and I'm not doing this for a client or anything. So I'm keeping it really loose. I really have no idea where I'm going with this, uh, from the very start. I kind of have a vague notion that I want to experiment with perspective a little bit and I want to have this sort of uh, character close in the foreground looking at a some kind of destination in the distance and that's kind of like the general guide I'm going by here it's a pretty common setup for the work that I tend to do and a lot of work in the uh, the concept art industry and for games and films and that kind of thing I think especially in games because you know having a character uh, up close like this serves a, a variety of purposes and and you know there's a reason why this is a pretty common motif among this type of artwork having a character in the foreground looking at a distant point um, of interest creates a really interesting uh, dynamic for the composition so you have basically two main focal points. You have the character, which depending upon how you set it up can be the primary or 
I think in most cases, especially for me, is sort of a, a secondary or or like sub focal point. So it's a point of interest, but it also serves to direct the viewer's focus back to the main point of interest, which in this case is this sort of distant castle uh, shape. And uh, there, there's this sort of interplay between those two points of interest. And so even at this point where I don't know exactly what I'm trying to create, I am paying attention to how I'm setting up the composition. You know, even from the very beginning, the first few strokes I put on the canvas, uh, they're broad, they're sort of loose, but they are creating suggestions of perspective, and they are setting up the composition to guide the viewer to specific areas of interest. So I'm doing that in a few ways. One is just with the, the direction of the strokes, and um, which in this first case is sort of indications of, of valleys or mountains leading down into this, um, this sort of river and, and castle area. All those lines are, are taking the eye away from the corner of the page and directing them towards these points of interest. And another way I'm doing that is through contrast. I've created this sort of highly reflective body of water around the, the sort of dark castle, and I've also created some highlights on that structure. So it's more detailed, there's some more contrast there, and so that's immediately, you know, at a glance, it's a point of interest. Likewise, with the character in the foreground, I'm messing around with some, some high contrast using some dark values that I don't use anywhere else in the painting, and that creates a point of interest and also reinforces the atmospheric perspective and creates depth. You'll notice that even at this phase, uh, my value range for distant objects and areas is extremely limited. It's, it's just uh, limited to sort of the upper light uh, slash highlight range. And especially in this first piece where I really want to convey distance, you know, the more I push that, the further away these things are going to look. So with the second uh, piece, I'm sort of exploring a variation on that first idea. I've kind of decided at this point that I want to explore this character a bit more. Uh, they're sort of vaguely defined in the first image as uh, I think I, I planned for them to be female at this point, to have a bow, and to be sort of um, maybe just some kind of uh, female archer character or something like that. So I'm, I'm taking her and I'm putting her in a different context, and I'm sort of taking similar elements and giving a different perspective, a different view on it. And this is a good skill to have and to explore, is to not just create a new idea from scratch, but to take something like that you like from the first idea and sort of create a variation on it. See if you can switch it up and improve it or provide a different mood or story or context. So here I'm taking that character and I'm putting her uh, not perched at the top of this scene, but kind of stuck um, at the bottom looking up. So I've switched, I've literally switched the, the perspective in the field of view. So we're looking up from the bottom rather than down from the top. And I can sort of illustrate that with just basic shapes. Um, relying on sort, sort of creating forms that are seen from the bottom. You know, if you visualize each object and area as a 3D plane, you're going to see a lot of the bottoms of things and not so much the top. Um, with, with the one exception here being kind of the, uh, the, the implied stairway that kind of zigzags through the painting. And um, I just have kind of angled that out a bit so, so you can read it a bit easier. Um, but otherwise, you know, I'm just, with all these strokes, with all these shapes I'm making, I'm trying to create these sort of arcs so it um, reinforces that bottom-up perspective. And I am, you know, I've, I've set up these scenes so that there really is, you know, you're looking up enough so that you wouldn't even really see the horizon line um, from this angle. You're kind of looking almost up at the sky 
you're seeing this structure from a bit of a, a, a bottom view and you'll notice here I've also used highlights to draw attention to that structure as the um, the main focal point and I've also used a pathway and other you know kind of shape cues to lead the eye to that area uh, as I have with the first image more literally with a pathway and a river that takes the eye uh, from the the viewer's standpoint along the the landscape and down around towards the main focal point. I've also made a, a point of not illuminating the entire structure in the second thumbnail uh, with the highlight. This is something I see a lot of really great artists doing, you know, if they have something in full sunlight, um, you know, this is an example of how you can use your artistic intuition over something that might be more realistic. So like this structure is supposed to be illuminated in full sun, but the top of it has kind of been shadowed out. And it's, you know, it's possible there could be a cloud passing by um, and sort of fading out that top area. But really the, the point of that is to sort of keep focus down towards the center of the canvas a bit more and not to have the eye lead off the top of the page with, with some contrast there. Um, and it also just sort of helps to establish some mood in the piece. And speaking of mood, you'll see what I'm doing in this third thumbnail is I'm starting from a very different point. I'm, I'm still using this character, but I'm telling a very different story. So again, I didn't know what I was going to create with this one, the first thing I did was I used a large soft brush to cue in some sort of a gradient in the background. And to me, immediately that read as sort of a foggy atmosphere. Um, and from there, I kind of deduced that maybe this was sort of a threatening scene, you know, maybe there's some danger here, uh, some mystery. And then I established the perspective by creating this um, this really exaggerated perspective uh, foreground. Um, I'm using a lot of these really long tapered shapes to create the impression that the viewer is close to the ground. And I've also set up the figure uh, to be very high up in the frame, which also reinforces that perspective. And then I've, I've added in these sort of shadowy imposing figures, um, which I've also sort of painted out with with the perspective in mind so you, it almost looks like you're sort of looking up at them and that just helps to reinforce the uh, the story that's being told here which which is starting to look like um, sort of a, a threatening situation like this character has just stumbled on this or, or, or is being ambushed by these creatures and they are on the defensive um, or at least they are wary of, of what's about to happen next and, you know, these are things to be thinking about um, as you're moving forward, you know, reading into the story and thinking about how you can use deliberate design choices to reinforce and tell that story. So, you know, again, like the last thing I did in that thumbnail was to create these just very quick um, sort of vague tree shapes around the border. Um, but even adding those quick lines in has helped to reinforce the perspective. They're sort of angled inward and that's helping to um, reinforce the field of view and the three point perspective and really makes the scene feel a bit more tense and dramatic. So uh, for the fourth thumbnail here, uh, again, I'm just kind of exploring a different perspective. This time I, I think all I really wanted to do was create more of a top-down view um, of the character looking down into more of a pit or um, you know something like that so I've I, the first thing I'm doing is just using these broad textured brush strokes to create lines of interest that are going down into this focal area um, and 
you know, I, again, I don't really know what these lines are forming. It's starting to look at this point like they might be uh, sort of a waterfall type formation leading down some, some stone platforms. Um, you'll notice, you know, even in small details like the direction that the bow is facing, you know, at first I drew it in as, as if it were pointing up from the right shoulder and um, I realized pretty quickly that that was sort of not helping the the visual direction so I changed it to be pointing over the left shoulder so that um, the eye would be more easily guided back along these these um, visual cues towards this this sort of uh, this focal point at the bottom here and again, I don't really know what this is. I'm just kind of playing around with shapes. Uh, I've used the wand tool to select areas of texture and then paint it in uh, over those, which is a great way to adjust your values or colors or um, anything really without disrupting the texture you've put down too much. That's something you'll see me doing a lot. You know, I. Um, experiment with a variety of different selection tool options and it's a really good habit to get into to to make some clean decisive moves throughout the process another thing that that kind of texture does at this point is um, you know You've noticed I, I've used some some variety here as far as the brushes a bit, but I stick to, you know, just a few at this point. Um, but sort of creating a lot of this broad, vague texture uh, right at the beginning is one way you can sort of stimulate your own imagination. Um, you know, this process is not just you putting your ideas down on the page. Um, it's it's a conversation between the strokes that you put down and your imagination. So it's good to be open to seeing new things in what you put down that aren't necessarily totally in line with your original vision and you know adjust that according to you know how essential some of those details are. You know for example if you're doing a, a commissioned piece and there are some really essential details you need to include um, you may want to rely more on your your planning and kind of creating deliberate um, objects and, and uh, features. Whereas if you're just painting and practicing and, and creating a piece for your own uh, purposes, it's a really great practice to go into a painting without um, too much of a a a plan, um, without too much of an idea of what you want to create and focus on instead just sort of letting the paint go down or you know the the digital paint in this case and um sort of reading from that and allowing that to inspire you and and looking within those shapes and textures for clues about what it is you're you're creating um i like to think about it like sort of a movie that you're watching you know when you when you go down to to a, a movie theater and to see a you know a new film you kind of know based on the the trailer or the preview kind of what it's going to be about but you know from the moment you sit down there you know you're going to see a movie you know that there's going to be characters and a plot arc and you might have a general idea of of what it might look like but um really you are discovering it as you go and i think that's a really important mindset to have during the painting process is is sort of this element of discovery um, as opposed to you know kind of imposing your creative will on the piece so going back to what I'm doing here on the canvas um, you'll notice I've I've taken I've literally taken the the thumbnail that I created and blown it up to a larger resolution canvas um so i you know this isn't something you have to do but it's kind of a, a shortcut for me um and sort of helps me just literally build on what i've i've created there and 
you know, refine that idea a bit more. Um, you can always just start a new canvas and paint it up from scratch. Um, it really just depends upon what works for your workflow. Um, but that's just generally what works for me. So the next thing I'm doing is sort of using the selection tool a lot to clearly define more of my shapes. And uh, a lot of what I'm doing in this process is creating just sort of a, a clear, decisive shape, uh, filling that in with the value that I want for that area, uh, and sometimes using the um, invert selection option to paint the other side of that. So I did that sort of with that river area in the upper center part of the canvas. I selected the river uh, section, painted that in with the value I wanted, then inverted the selection with, I believe it's shift control I uh, by default and use that inverted selection to paint in the other value for the shore. And this is just a nice way to create some clean, clear shapes. And I find, especially at this point in the process, but you know, even throughout the painting, I, I will have to sort of step back and use that process to clarify a lot of my shapes and my values. It's really easy to sort of get sucked into the painting and start creating a lot of really sketchy strokes and uh, a lot of lost edges and a lot of sort of vague detail. And, you know, ultimately it doesn't help. It may be interesting, but if you get too wrapped into it and then you look at the piece overall, for example, in the navigator, you might realize that you've lost some of the clarity of your composition and the shapes in that composition. So uh, the selection tool or the lasso tool is super helpful for me. And it's one of the great benefits of working in the digital medium is at any point you can just sort of create these clear shapes uh, of value or texture and fill them in from there. So yeah, at this point, I'm just really trying to clarify a lot of these areas that were sort of vaguely defined in the thumbnail. And I've also, one of the first things I did was I separated out the foreground on a new layer. And this is really helpful for a variety of reasons. One is that it's a pretty complex shape and it's overlapping a lot of the background area. So if I kept this all one layer, it would be pretty hard to work around that, you know, to paint in detail in the foreground character and also retain the, the detail and the integrity of the background. So even with complex piece visually, uh, and, and despite separating out the foreground like that, I tend to try to keep my layers as simple and few as possible. And, you know, I, I'll create more throughout the process as needed, but frequently merge them down and try to keep it to two to three max. Uh, at least earlier on in the process. Towards the editing phase, sometimes it'll get a little hectic with experimenting with different color balance and, uh, you know, final editing options. But for the majority of the process, it's just helpful for me and my focus and, you know, keeping the whole process loose to just limit it to basically a foreground layer and a background layer, sometimes maybe a mid-ground layer, like I've done in this piece here, I eventually separate out the mid-ground section because there's a pl pretty clear cut between those three layers, and it's just useful to be able to work on them independently. But the more layers you include in your piece, at least it, with my workflow, the harder it is to be uh, flexible and like open to new changes and to have the piece be a bit more cohesive. So 
the next thing I'm doing is I'm just sort of drawing in some more detail around my focal points. I'm leaving everything else pretty vague, but there are two areas that I know I'm going to have a lot, uh, I'm going to want to have a lot of focus and detail and contrast. And that's around the, the castle structure in the distance and around the character's uh, head and shoulders and uh, sort of face area. She has some pretty interesting equipment and features up there. And those are, again, serving as a secondary focal point that will help to redirect focus as well towards the distant object. And what I'm doing here is I'm also checking the perspective and manipulating the forms and shapes as needed to reinforce that perspective. I know this character is pretty close to the viewer's uh, perspective here. And to reinforce that, I'm kind of exaggerating the three point perspective a bit. I'm having, you know, the, the, for example, what I did there was I took part of the bow and just sort of blew it out and use the transform tool to bring it a little closer. So it looks like even though the bow's actual shape would be symmetrical here, I've turned it a little bit at an angle. So it's, it's facing outward and tapering towards the center of the canvas. And I'm sort of going through a lot of these foreground shapes and trying to reinforce that effect a little bit. And I'm also just trying to clarify these shapes and the silhouette overall. You know, at this point, it's good to do things like look at the navigator. Does this read well as a crouched figure? Uh, are the different protruding elements such as the hair blowing in the wind and the, the bow quiver that I'm painting in here, are they conflicting? Are they reading well together? It can be really tempting to add in a lot of fun, interesting details and protrusions uh, to a character like this, but you have to kind of bear in mind how they're affecting the overall composition and flow of the piece and how, you know, you have to kind of think bigger than like, oh, I want to create a bunch of fun, interesting armor and weapons and hair and that kind of stuff and think about how this specific area is affecting the whole piece and it's it can be difficult but I try to maintain that no matter what scale I'm, I'm looking at so I've zoomed in a little here on the character and the side of her face just to because I know that's gonna be a, a, a point of focus and detail but even within that section I'm thinking about how I can create shapes that are conducive to sort of keeping the flow going throughout the whole piece, you know. Um, I I may not be sort of thinking about that consciously as I work, but, you know, the more you pay attention to that sort of stuff, the more it becomes ingrained in your workflow. So a lot of what I'm doing with this character's overall shapes is I'm trying to funnel attention from the corner of the canvas and the side of the canvas up along these sort of curving interesting pathways such as the curvature of the bow the the straight line of the bow string um, the sort of the flow of the cloak and the the uh, the flow of the hair in the wind all these are sort of serving as funnels in a way from the areas of non-focus into the areas of focus and other than that, I don't want to create too much specific detail. Uh, you'll see with, with the base of the, the platform that she's on, this kind of rocky outcropping. I'm not, I'm not creating too much literal detail at this point, especially. Uh, I want it to be mostly just a suggestion of the perspective and the texture that's there. But otherwise... It's just supportive detail. It's not intended to, to grab you so much as it is to, to support the character and her viewpoint. And 
So again, another benefit of having this on a different layer is that I was able to take the whole thing and transform it. Uh, now knowing a little bit more clearly what what I want the perspective to be like, I've adjusted it a little bit. I use the transform tool to sort of expand that foreground area a bit, uh, and that helps to reinforce this sort of dramatic two-point perspective of the, the platform that she's sitting on. And it also, I, I've tilted her a little bit so that she's leaning in. And again, that sort of just reinforces this momentum of all of these lines converging in this one area of interest. And again, I've also created a literal pathway from the foreground all the way throughout the painting. And this is something I, I really like to do in all, in all my works. Sometimes it's more implied than, than it is here. In this case, it's a very specific road. And then that's carried on by the river uh, that leads around the castle. But even if you don't include a specific path, it's good to sort of keep that in mind while you're putting the piece together. It's good to have a sort of an implied sense of directionality where the the viewer can put themselves and travel along this path um, quite literally in their imagination throughout all these different points of interest. So in this case, um, that path starts in the foreground just beneath the character. So there, there are essentially a few different ways to move through this piece. And that's important as well to have sort of a diversity of, of path options that the eye can take. And that sort of helps to build some interest around, around the piece. But it starts in the foreground. There's this sort of exaggerated zigzag as it recedes uh, down the mountainside, which again reinforces that perspective with these sharp angles towards the middle and then disappears over the horizon line. And that path will either lead you across the bridge to the castle, or it will lead you around the castle uh, along this river, which also serves as an access point from the top of the, of the canvas. So no matter where you start here, you're gonna end up just circulating back around to these points of interest. <laughs> 